Good morning. Give me a wave if you're still with me after all that administration. Come on, wave to me. If somebody's fallen asleep next to you, just give them a little dig in the ribs. Intimacy, deepening our trust and our faith. I was recently on an overnight retreat and I'd been asked to do the devotional the next morning. And I awoke in the middle of the night with these words in my head, switch from hope to faith. And I knew it was God, and I immediately responded, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Do you ever do that with God? Like, what are you saying? I said to him, you're going to have to explain this to me. God showed me that there were important areas of my life where I was asking in hope, not faith. Asking with no sense of assurance or conviction. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith goes beyond just hope. God was asking me to deepen my faith, to ask in faith for the things that weighed heavy on my soul. Now how does this link to intimacy? Reaching for my journal that night, and turning on the bedside lamp, God gave me this. Faith is built on trust. And trust comes from intimacy. So when we deepen our intimacy, trust deepens and our faith deepens. God showed me a personal area of my life where I was not asking with any faith or any sense of authority or conviction. I was asking in hope and in desperation, but with no sense of assurance. Now, there is nothing wrong with hope, but I sense God challenging me to shift from just hope to praying from a place of greater trust and greater faith. You see, we all have areas of our life where trust has been eroded in God's ability to bring change. Just think for a moment about your life. Areas in your life where your trust in God's ability to bring change has been eroded. In this intimate counter that I had in the middle of the night, God showed me his great love for the situation I had lost faith in. And he showed me his grief which matched my own and surpassed my own. In that moment, as everything was stripped bare, I was gently brought to a place of repentance. My trust restored in a God who does know and who does care. I was able to ask in faith concerning this situation and able to ask with assurance and conviction. Matthew 21, 22 reminds us that whatever we ask in prayer, we will receive if we have faith. We as a church and we as individuals have been called to intimacy. It is the foundation on which everything else is built. When Jesus was asked, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus responded, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The first and greatest commandment. If you leave with nothing else today, leave with this. The first and greatest thing you need is intimacy with God. Life for you may not be going to plan right now. Maybe you're feeling quite distant, unloved, lonely. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. Come back to the first and greatest commandment. 
I recently read in a Facebook post of one of my friends these words. God is aware of all of our shortcomings, but he's never changed his mind about us. We change our minds about God. We're often quite fickle and unreliable. But God's desire for intimacy with you has never changed. So why is intimacy the foundation on which our faith, our trust, our life is to be built on? What does intimacy do in our life? Before I go any further, I just want to share a truth about intimacy. Recently, I caught up with a friend and she was sharing about her journey with God. I came away and I remember saying to God, wow, she really has an intimate relationship with you, more intimate than me. Maybe someone like that should be preaching this message. God's immediate response was, not more intimate, just different. Every person's intimacy with me looks different. And this is really important. Don't compare. Just as couples' relationships look different and people express their love for each other in different ways, the same goes with our relationship with God. No two relationships are going to look the same and neither should they. Now, why is intimacy so foundational, so foundational to our lives? In intimate moments, it is like a mirror is held up to God and we see him as he truly is. At the same time, that mirror is held up to us and we see ourselves as we truly are. Everything gets stripped away. Our false thinking Everything that separates crumbles away. In intimate moments with God, it's like we see clearly and we hear clearly. Everything gets exposed. The goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, the love of God. And our frailties get exposed. Our sin gets exposed. Like looking into a mirror, we see ourselves truly and we see God truly. Faced with the overwhelming goodness of God and the overwhelming truth of our need for him, we are often gently led to repentance. But our frailties and our sin are not the only things that get exposed when we have intimate moments with God. He also reveals to us our value. He reminds us how precious we are to him. Reflected in the mirror, we often see clearly what needs to change in us. 2 Corinthians 3.18 captures this beautiful transformation process that takes place in intimate moments with God. And we all, with unveiled face, Continually seeing as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are progressively being transformed into his image. From one degree of glory to even more glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We emerge from intimate moments with God with greater trust. A greater assurance of God which leads to a stronger more assured faith. So what does your intimacy with God look like? The imagery that came through Pastor Andrew's dream, which this sermon series of intimacy was built on, was of two armchairs facing each other, of you and God sitting face to face. Not just hoping for, but knowing his nearness. Being assured that his gaze is on you. Does your intimacy with God need to deepen? Is your faith and trust eroded? 
Do you need to shift your chair? Is your armchair at the moment in the same room as God's, but it's not facing him directly? Or are you even in the room with God? Is your armchair even in the room with God? I've been a Christian since I was 10. And in my journey, I've seen many friends and loved ones uh, put their armchair into storage. What I mean by that is, is that along the way, their faith and trust gets eroded. And their armchair, they just kind of put it away. I've even had some of them say to me, well, if God's real, he can just turn up in my life. But I'm not going to seek him anymore. He can just turn up. And in my heart, I'm thinking, it's not God that's moved. He's still there in his armchair. It's you that's moved. Maybe you've given up completely or maybe today you haven't even started your journey with God. If either of these are true, then you need to know today that he loves you. His heart has never changed towards you. He is inviting you into a loving relationship with him today. For those of you who do know Jesus, what are the areas in your life where you've lost faith? Or your faith in God's ability to bring change has become eroded? Are there areas in your life that you feel you just can't trust God with that? God has not changed his mind about us. He tells us that there is nothing that can separate us from his love. A love that seeks us out, pursues us, waits patiently for us to choose to love him with all our heart and all our souls, and all our minds. He has already chosen you wholeheartedly. And he longs for you to choose him in the same way, wholeheartedly. So if God's intimacy is always available to us, if his armchair is always pulled up near, waiting for us to join him, If he is ever seeking us out, what is preventing you today from drawing near? Just stop and think for a moment. Those of you in this room that at some point have come to know Jesus, what impacts on your intimacy with God and ultimately your trust and your faith? Those of you who don't know God, what is preventing you today from accepting his love for you, his invitation to you? Is it busyness or burnout? Does that impact on your relationship with God, your busyness? Or are you in a place of burnout? Elijah experienced both these things. And just like Elijah, God can still meet you in the midst of your circumstances. Is it insecurity? Feeling like you're just not good enough? Does this impact on your relationship with God and your intimacy with him? Moses felt like this. He didn't feel good enough. He ran away. He hid in the desert. But God still found him there. What about fear? Does fear impact your intimacy with God? Gideon was someone in the Bible experiencing fear. And God still found him in his hiding place. What about shame? Peter was full of shame. And God tracked him down. 
He cooked him breakfast and invited him back into his armchair. What about pride? Are you still holding on too strongly to control of your life? Jonah thought that he knew a better way than God. And God pursued him and he taught him that his way always works out better in our lives. There's a beautiful story in the Bible that I love. It's the woman who's caught in adultery. That's not the part I love. The part I love is that this woman is experiencing rejection and she's caught in sin. And Jesus meets her there in the dirt. And he lifts her head. He forgives her. What about grief or disappointment? Disillusionment? Loss. Naomi in the Bible experienced all these things. And in the darkest of journeys, God met her and he crafted a new beginning for her. Let me share with you the one that impacts my intimacy that I wrestle with the most. Laziness. A nicer word is procrastination. Put up your, if your, your hand if you're brave enough to join me on that. Procrastinate, yeah. Yeah, there's a few of us. Glad I'm not on my own. You see, intimacy requires intentionality and it requires our time. It requires a slowing down of our fast-paced, crowded minds and hearts. The verse we shared earlier speaks of loving God with all of our hearts and with all our souls and with all our minds. That means that some things have to get out of the way. Some things that have taken up space in our hearts and our souls and our minds need to get out of the way. Whatever our reasons today, Whatever the things are that impact our intimacy, many times we don't want to look into the mirror. We're afraid of his conviction, afraid of his challenge, scared of what he might ask us to give up or surrender. Proverbs 3 verses 5 to 6 say, Trust in the Lord." With all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Trust today that the Lord knows you better than you know yourself. He also knows what you need better than you know yourself. Trust today that he's a good father. Intimate encounters with God change the course of our lives. They form the foundations on which everything else is built, like faith and trust. I want to share an intimate encounter that I had with God with you to show you how it can change the course of your life and actually become foundational. So in my 20s, I was at a conference and I had joined the kind of uh, worship, learning about worship, being involved in worship strain that you could choose. And part of it was that at the end, you got to sing as part of the massive choir at this conference. So I'm on stage as part of this huge choir and we're singing this song, He's a Father to the Fatherless. Now, if you know my story, I was put up for adoption at two weeks old, okay? So we're singing this song. He's a father to the fatherless, the answer to my prayer. And as I sang those words, it was like a video reel went on in my head. And I could see 
this video playing out. And God showed me that at two weeks of age, he showed me lying in a crib in the hospital where I had been put up for adoption and I was crying in the crib because I knew that whoever had been holding me was no longer there. And God showed me that he walked into that room. He put his hands on the crib and he leant over me and he said, I will be your father. And what the enemy has determined for evil in your life, I will turn it around for good. And in this moment, standing in this choir, it was like rejection and the things that I had battled. I was quite a people pleaser because I was so insecure about my own self-worth. I would crave it from other people. So I try to please them so that they would, they would you know, pat me on the back and tell me how good I was. But in that moment that God showed me his great love for me and that he was in my story, that he had chosen to be my father, it was like the rejection thing got turned off. And I was so sure of my value. And from that moment on, that became a foundation on which I could build the rest of my relationship with God and my relationship with others. That complete security that I was valued and I was known and I was loved and I was wanted. God today is inviting us all to deepen our intimacy with him and our trust and our faith in him. And we're going to take some time today to lean into that. I'm going to invite the musicians and singers to come. So what we're going to do as we end this service is we're going to close our eyes and we're each going to imagine those two armchairs. Now some of you may have to rearrange your armchair because maybe it's not quite facing God at the moment. Maybe you have to get it out of storage. But we're going to visualise those two armchairs and we're going to visualise ourselves facing God. You can have an intimate encounter with God anywhere. This week I was on the bus to school the E41 that takes me to Typo. And I visualised myself sitting in an armchair with God facing me sitting in his armchair. And he said to me, Susanna, I love you. And I went to turn my head because sometimes you're embarrassed when you realise how much you're loved and how... Uh, how much we can let God down because we don't give him back the same level of love. But as I went to turn my head in shame, he gently drew my head back and he said, don't look away. Hold my gaze. Let's do this together. And he held my hands. Today, when you visualise that armchair, don't turn your face away. Hold his gaze. You're not alone. He'll do it with you together. He loves you. So we're going to take some time now the music will just play in the background. Shut out every distraction. You are so important to God. He's waiting for you. And if you choose to sit in that armchair, know that he will be right there with you. And he's got something to say to you today. It might come as a picture. It might come as one gentle word. But he's got something for you today.
So we're going to take some time to be intimate with him.